Chapter 9 Ashnod The invasion party was stalled outside the walls of Zegon, and Hajar knew Mishra well enough to realize he was worried. But Mishra would not tell the Kadir about his concerns, nor, for that matter, would Hajar. In the last few years, the Kadir had grown to manhood, and not all of his development had been good. The eager young man who was interested in Argivian folk tales had blossomed into an overweight tyrant. He was pampered by his tribe and supporters, and appeased by the tribes that now followed the Suwardi. No one said no to him. At least no one survived to say no a second time. What was once petulance had now transformed into foul-tempered rants. What once was eager bravery was now foolhardiness. He had become fatter than his father ever had been, but was still convinced he could lead battles himself. His moods were mercurial, his responses violent. As the Kadir grew more tyrannical, Mishra grew more popular among the Suwardi. The former slave knew how to speak to the Kadir in such a way that he could present the most unpalatable options and escape with his head still attached to his body. The Kadir's war captains noticed this first, then the courtiers, and lastly the chiefs of other tribes. Soon those with bad news or new plans visited Mishra first for his advice and aid before speaking directly to the Kadir. For his part, Mishra was open and welcoming to a people that had held him as a slave so recently. He was well versed in desert lore and legend, and always had the correct analogy, the right words, and an ewer of Nabi's handy. But he always made clear his advice was based upon what was best for the Kadir of the Suwardi. He crossed the Kadir directly only with the greatest reluctance. Early on, there was little need to argue with the Kadir at all. There was a moment of wavering among some of the tribes, the Thalad in particular, when word spread that the old Kadir was dead, but such rumblings of independence were drowned by the greater rumblings of the dragon engine now possessed by the Suwardi. Early on, the young Kadir made it a point to visit the main clans of each of his allies, strong or weak. Each was in turn impressed by the power of the great metal beast. Some preached that it was a sign from the old ones themselves, a demonstration that they favored the Falaji in their attempts to keep the desert free of such invaders as the Argivians and the Yoshins. This despite the fact that the old Kadir and a number of good Falaji warriors had all perished in the dragon engine's initial attack. Similarly, tribes now regarded the young Kadir as the ruler of the Makfawa, handily ignoring the fact that it was really the Kadir's wizard, his Argivian Raki, who controlled the beast, but Falaji logic was simple in this regard as well. The outlander wizard might control the beast, but the Kadir controlled the wizard. The Suwardi soon discovered that only the Raki could control the great dragon engine. As soon as he passed the power stone to another, with great reservations and only on the Kadir's direct orders, the dragon engine reared up on its hind treads and threatened to run amok. After a few such experiments, the gem was put permanently into Mishra's hands, and those in the tribe who knew of it were informed the gem would stay there. Mishra could put the beast to sleep while he rested and make it respond to his slightest whim. Indeed, Hajar noticed that soon no real words were spoken between the Raki and his mechanical servant. A gesture or nod was enough. The Suwardi conquest of the deep desert was not entirely without incident. A group of hotheads from the Thaladin clan tried to ambush the Kadir's possession. The main part of the caravan retreated before their assault, and Mishra unleashed his dragon engine among the young riders. Fifteen died, including the Thaladin chieftain's son, without loss of a single Suwardi. The Thaladin submitted soon afterward. After solidifying his position in the eastern desert, the Kadir looked west. Onion Dome Tomakul was the center of the Falaji power, its greatest and oldest city. Mishra said he was more concerned about Argivian patrols along the eastern borders and the increased activities of the Yoshins to the south. In reality, Hajar knew he wanted more time to study his marvelous creature, but the Kadir would not be dissuaded. The party headed west toward the capital. Time was of the essence, the Kadir said, in order to counter any plans made in the halls of Tomakul's many palaces. He need not have worried, as Tomakul was rotten as an old fruit, waiting for the slightest tap to split apart. In many ways, the city dwellers were more like Yoshins than Falaji. They were preoccupied with wealth, money, and caravans. As long as the Kadir promised to not interfere with their daily lives, they were quite content to open their gates to him. The Kadir accepted their tribute, but would not enter the city. Instead, he camped beyond their walls in the shadow of his great beast and made the city folk come to him. Hajar and Mishra had gone into the city. They found it beautiful and corrupt, wondrous and diseased. Here, trade routes from the Saranth to Krug converged with those from the eastern coastal nations 
to Teresia City farther west. The last was no more than a legend to Hajar, a city of scholars far to the west who traded with the desert folk for artifacts and old tales much as the Argivians have. The city was a brightly colored cavalcade of different people, dwarves from Sardia, holy men of distant Gix, and Minotaur mariners from some far-off islands. There were warriors in zebra-hide capes from Zegon, and furred traders from the Yumuk nation in the shadow of its great glacier. Yoshin merchants trod the city streets as well, visibly nervous among the celebratory Falaji, and there were other folk wandering the narrow byways who defied identification of homeland or race. But in the end, Hajar and Mishra retreated to the desert to confer with their Kadir. Though Mishra strongly urged his chieftain to push on toward the west to this reputed city of scholars, the Kadir determined they would move south instead. To Zegon they would go, he said, to the place that shared its heritage with the Falaji and was rightfully part of their shared empire. Mishra argued, but in the end, the Kadir made it clear the matter was closed. And now, mused Hajar, they were stalled outside the capital city of Zegon with 500 men and a mechanical dragon. Worse, the dragon was misbehaving. It was a simple matter. When they got within a half mile of the capital, the Makfoa stalled. It simply refused to proceed any farther toward the city. It could move to the east or west or back up, but it would not come any closer to Zegon, and no amount of mental commands, hand motions, shouting, or hitting it could convince the mechanical beast otherwise. The Kadir, not one to be denied, was apocalyptic. He wanted the beast looming before Zegon's front gates when the city surrendered. Instead, his armies were within sight of the city's whitewashed walls, but could advance no farther. Hajar could see the city guard lined up on the battlements of the outer wall, spears in hand, almost taunting the Kadir's armies. Some of the spears had skulls on their points, no doubt some additional Zigani taunt Hajar was unfamiliar with. The only thing the Kadir's forces could do was make the best of a bad situation. The dragon engine began a long, slow patrol around the perimeter of the city, keeping the half-mile distance that seemed to hold it at bay like a physical wall. A message was sent to the leaders of Zegon, calling their attention to the power of the dragon engine and demanding the city's immediate capitulation. The Zigoni sent back a terse note that they would consider the Kadir's offer, and he was welcome to wait while they made up their minds. That defiance did not improve the Kadir's mood. That evening in his tent, he railed against his captains, in particular against his rocky. Why can't you move it any closer? he thundered. We don't know why, said Mishra calmly. Why don't you know? cried the Kadir. Because you have demanded we run all over the continent and pressing the other tribes, thought Hajar. Because we have not had the time or the resources to study the beast, other than what hurried sketches we can make while moving from place to place. Because if it had not been a priority for you until now. Hajar wondered if Mishra was thinking the same. Instead, the Kadir's Rocky said, It could be many things. Possibly there's something about the city itself that keeps it at bay. Or it may be something about the nature of the Makfawa. There may be some item that the Zagoni have that's affecting the engine. We don't have enough information to be sure. Right now the question is, do we press on, or do we fold our tents and abandon Zegon, contenting ourselves with the riches of a united desert nation? The Kadir slumped back into his pillows, and a serving girl bathed his head with a damp cloth. He ignored her and said, You have traveled through this land. It is rich in timber and metals. It is properly part of our empire. Its people are Falaji in origin. As much as the Tamuku were, thought Hajar. Indeed, from what he had seen of the Zagoni, they were much like the city-dwelling Falaji in their mercantile outlook. He wondered idly if all the coastal nations had some unknown means of stopping the dragon engine and how the Kadir would react if that were indeed the case. The Kadir was still talking. We go on. We patrol with the dragon engine. We start leveling the smaller towns beyond the half-mile radius. We drive people into the capital, panicked people who tell what monster that lies waiting beyond the gates. In the meantime, we send the messengers back to Tomakul to gather more warriors. We'll assemble enough to break down the walls if need be. Hajar thought the plan represented the waste of a better part of a year, but if any of the war captains agreed with him, they remained silent. A few advisers had argued loudly with the Kadir in the past. They had disappeared soon afterward. The only one who seemed to get away with it was Mishra, and he had several tons of dragon to support his argument. But Mishra only nodded and said, We will need siege machinery, nothing complex, simple battering rams to assault their gates from all sides. That, in addition to a large amount of troops, should be enough. Hajar wondered, not for the first or last time, why Mishra did not simply use the power of the dragon engine to escape from the Kadir's petty tyranny, 
or to establish himself as Kadir. The former digger thought he knew the answer to that question, though. The Raki could overturn the Kadir and even maintain a core group of tribes to support him. But to what end? He had no apparent desire to rule over the power behind the throne. Hajar was still turning these matters over in his mind as he and Mishra walked back to the Raki's tent, located on the outskirts of the encampment on the off chance that the Raki might summon more dragons in the dead of night. Mishra was quiet, as he always was after one of the Kadir's explosions. A guard stood outside of the Raki's tent, which was unusual. More unusual, the brazier within was already lit, and the tent inside a warm, inviting glow. Visitor, said the guard. His accent was atrocious, and Ajar immediately pegged him as one of the westerners from the tribes of Tomokul. It is late, said Mishra. The guard shrugged. Does the Kadir know? asked Mishra, earning another shrug. Hajar felt his irritation rise at the guard. What good is a guard who doesn't guard anything? Is this the kind of man to whom we are trusting our empire? I see, said Mishra without apparent anger. Go back to your duties. The man gave a gold tooth smile and faded into the darkness. Mishra stepped into his tent, regarding the interloper. I've been expecting you, he said, much to Hajar's surprise. I'm glad you made yourself at home in my absence. The visitor was a woman, among the most cruelly beautiful women Hajar had ever seen. Red hair was rare in the desert and was taken as an evil omen among the Suardi. Hers was the red of a flickering camp flame. It rolled over her shoulders in thick, wavy curls. Her eyes were the gray-green of the sea that lapped Zegon's shores, and just as stormy. She was dressed in mannish armor of the Outlander style, but the armor had been cut and shaped more to favor her figure than to offer any real protection. Hajar realized he had stopped breathing. He inhaled deeply and wondered if she had noticed. She was reclining on Mishra's pillows as she stretched as she entered. I was expected, she asked. Her voice was soft but carried a razor's edge with it. You or someone like you, replied Mishra calmly. You represent Zegon's rulers and you're going to propose a deal to save your city? I don't remember telling anyone that, but the guard I have bribed. If he told you, I'll have to have him killed. Not to worry, returned Mishra. He will be punished enough for letting an outlander into camp. Regardless of the bribe, he will be made an example of, and in the end, he will wish you had killed him. May I offer you some nabis? Please, said the woman, and Mishra motioned for Hajar to put a newer of wine on the brazier. He sat down opposite the woman and waited for her to begin. Instead, she stared at Hajar. Your manservant, she said coldly. Hajar bridled at the insult. He is my bodyguard, said Mishra. He should not be here said the woman shortly. Go, said Mishra to Hajar, still staring intently at the woman. Hajar began to protest, but Mishra cut him off. Go to your tent, tell no one. If I need anything, I will shout. Hajar wavered a moment and looked at Mishra. The Argivian revealed nothing, but merely watched the woman sitting among his pillows. He seemed as he was with the Kadir, thought Hajar, closed and unapproachable. The Falaji sighed deeply and bowed, then backed out of the tent. His face marked his disapproval. You are right, of course, said the woman as soon as Hajar left. I have been empowered by the rulers of Zegon to negotiate on their behalf with the Falaji invaders. But you are not Zagoni, observed Mishra. A small smile played across the woman's face. And you are not Falaji. I am Mishra, Raki of the Suardi, returned Mishra. I am Ashnod, said the woman, of nothing in particular. Is Zegon your home? asked Mishra, running a hand over the rim of the metal ewer. The Nabi is almost ready. I did not say that, answered Ajnan. Are you loyal to them? inquired the Rocky. I did not say that either. I merely told you that they empowered me to speak on their behalf. They agreed quite readily. I'm afraid some of them feel I could make a muck of things and get myself killed. They can forswear me and will breathe more easily. And the offer you are presenting is? inquired the Argivian, reaching for the metal cups. Ashnod cocked her head for a moment and said, just a moment. She reached down on the floor at the base of the pillows and brought up a long staff. It was made of black thunderwood and was topped by a tangle of copper wires and the narrow skull of some sea creature. She raised the staff quickly and pointed it at the doorway. Ashnod barked a string of words and the tangle of copper wires sang a discordant song. Wisps of lightning raced along the tracery wires into the skull itself. The staff lurched a fraction in her hand, but Mishra saw no obvious beam or discharge. He did see the effect. Just outside the entrance, Hajar gave a choked scream and fell into view, clutching his chest. Mishra was on his feet at once, 
crossing the tent and kneeling beside his bodyguard. Hajar twitched as he stopped beside him. So cold, managed the Falaji. It feels so cold. We were to be left alone, said Ashnod stonily. She lowered the staff. Her forehead was damp with perspiration. I hate it when underlings cannot follow orders. The chill wave of nausea passed through Hajar, and slowly the world righted itself. She, he gasped, she did this? She did, agreed Mishra, helping his bodyguard to his feet. Because you disobeyed an order. I told you to go to your tent. But go now, old friend, said Mishra. Hajar looked at the young man, and there was nothing. No, there was a faint trace of a smile on his face. Mishra was pleased. By Hajar's loyalty? No, thought the bodyguard. There was more to it than that. He was pleased by something the woman had done. He was pleased Ashnod had attacked the bodyguard with her witch staff. Hajar pulled himself to his feet. And Hajar, said Mishra. Hajar turned. Thank you for not screaming too loudly, said the Argivian again, with the ghost of a smile. I want to go talk to our guest before any guards arrive. Now go! Hajar stumbled into the night. Mishra watched him disappear in the darkness before turning back. Ashnod had taken the opportunity to pour the Nabis into its brass cups and was reclining on the pillows again, looking as if nothing out of the ordinary had occurred. The skull-tipped staff was back at the base of the pillows. Mishra took his own cup and sat down opposite her. Then he laughed. It started as a small chuckle, descended into a chortle, then moved into a full-fledged belly laugh. At length, he offered his cup and a toast and says, That was very foolish. Ashnod looked indignant and did not raise her cup in response. He was spying on us and disobeyed your order. Mishra took a long pull of the Nabis and chuckled again. No, not attacking Ajar, but by attacking him the way you did, you tipped your hand. Ashnod gave him a cross look and Mishra smiled. The woman noted it was a warm grin, without malice, and relaxed for the moment. That staff, Mishra said. You made it? Yes, she replied. Mishra nodded to himself and smiled again. That's what's keeping the dragon engine at bay, isn't it? The guards along the Zigon walls held similar staves. You made the staves and told the Zagoni rulers they could keep the great evil Falaji away from their city. Slowly, Ashnon nodded. Your engine is a big target, Mishra continued. But your staves have a flaw. They take a lot out of the user. Ashnod was silent. After using it only briefly, you're sweating, added Mishra. Ashnod grunted. Men sweat. Women glow. You were glowing like a horse after a hard race then, Mishra chuckled. And if the city guards were similarly affected, they would be debilitated. The rulers of Zegon would not be pleased by that. Ashnod snorted. The rulers are all too quick to adopt my stays for the defense, she said. Once the guards started to weaken from their use, those same rulers panicked. And sent you in the desert to sue for peace, added Mishra. They probably said it was your idea that encouraged them to resist, so it was your fault. You've met the Zagoni before? said Ashnod, a small smile crossing her lips. I've dealt with their types in many forms, said Mishra, leaning back. So tell me, what do they want? Bare minimum. Ashnod took a deep breath. Tomakul's deal. The surrender, pay some tribute, recognize your boy as ultimate leader, and get back to their lives. Mishra considered. Sounds reasonable. Not to say that the Kadir will be reasonable. After all, you did stop us in our tracks, if only temporarily. I'll see what I can do. The Argivian set his cup down. Now let me see your toy. She looked into Mishra's eyes for a moment, as if trying to determine what malice, if any, lay within. Then she handed the staff to him. The Falaji Raki turned the staff over in his hands. I see. Some Thran influences. But this is new. How does it work? It affects the nerves on the body, replied Ashnan. The lightning in the staff upsets the body's mechanism that allows one to feel and distinguish pain. Too much upset and the target is incapacitated. At the range of your dragon engine, it was not severely affected. But it would come no closer. Nerves, said Mishra, nodding and tapping the small power crystal that had been set within the staff's skull. Right, agreed Ashnod, setting her cup down and leaning forward. The body has all manner of systems within it, living tubes for blood, soft wires for nerves, strands for cable, for muscle. She reached out, touching Mishra's arm. He did not flinch or pull away. You are no book scholar. Your arms are like spun steel. Life in the desert is hard, said Mishra softly. I never thought the body as a machine. It is the 
best machine, said Ashnod, releasing his arm. Tested in the field, continually growing and self-replicating. Once we understand the mysteries of our own body, we understand the world. Everything else will fall into place. Your dragon engine is a wonder, but it is a crude imitation of living things. Mishra chuckled. This is the first real conversation I've had in a long while. Ashnod curled up amongst the pillows. There is lack of intellectual companionship among the Falaji. Mishra laughed and leaned forward. Most of the conversations I've had with the Sawardi along the lines of, You give me that, in various forms, followed closely by, You and what army? The young man chuckled again and set down the staff. I hadn't considered the body as a machine, but it makes sense. After all, we create things in our own image. Perhaps the Thran did as well. He moved over and sat next to Ashnod. Ashnod leaned close. Mishra could smell her musky perfume, accented with the tang of drying sweat. It was a pleasant combination. I think I can convince the Kadir to accept your ruler's request, he said softly. I thought you could, said Ashnod. You seem very capable. There's that. Ashnod wondered if Mishra smiled at anyone else in that fashion. The Raki added, And the fact that our most revered one is still impatient as a child... If he had to wait for reinforcements from Tomokul, he would explode from the delay. Of course, there's one other thing. Ashnod pulled away from him. One other thing? Mishra said, The Zagoni must be seen to pay for their token resistance. They must suffer more than Tomokul, which threw open its gates to us. We will need additional guarantees. Guarantee? asked Ashnod. The Falaji take hostage to encourage obedience, said Mishra. Surely taking their premier artificer would be sufficient? Ashnod's eyes became slits. And would I be Falaji hostage or yours? Mishra smiled again and there was a touch of maliciousness in the expression. The Falaji have little use for women, he said, beyond the basics. The basics do not include intelligent conversation, correct? inquired Ashnod. You have the general idea, returned her companion. You would be viewed more as something we are denying the Zagoni, as opposed to something to benefit the tribe. Ashnod leaned forward and touched Mistress Cheek. Hostage is such a nasty word. How does assistant sound? Mistress' eyebrows raised for a moment, then settled again. Is that really what you came here for? Am I so transparent? She asked, coy once again. As glass, said Mistress, and laughed. When would you like to begin your lesson? Lessons in the morning, said Ashnod in a throaty whisper. This evening we are alone, and I don't think your bodyguard is coming back any time soon. Mishra smiled and closed the grate on the brazier. There were no more words that evening. In the morning, it would be announced that the city of Zegon, fearful of the great dragon engine, had joined the Falangi Empire. Tribute would be paid, and obedience made to the great and revered Kadir the Suwardi, ever the first among equals. As terms of their surrender, the Zagoni agreed to remove the gates of their city so they could never stand in opposition to the Falaji again, and they gave up their best artificer, who joined the Falaji camp as the Rocky's apprentice. If any of the warriors felt uncomfortable about the presence of the cold-eyed woman with her cursed hair in their midst, they did not say so, at least not where the Rocky could overhear. Soon afterward, word arrived that the outlanders along the coast were making heavy raids into Falaji lands and the invasion force turned east again.